This is a shrimp cocktail. Ocean bugs accompanied by a delicious fruit and herb paste. Perfect for any fancy party. But late one night on the eve of one such party, as your fifth free drink sits empty in front of you, and you gaze into the shrimp cocktail, have you ever thought, you know what, that is the perfect material for making fabric out of? N no? Just me? Well, that's why we're here, to answer questions no sane person would have asked. Today, we're going to see how we can go from shrimp to sheets, but along the way learn why this is actually a lot less insane of an idea than it may initially seem. So let's dive right in. How can we process these ocean bugs into wearable sheets? Well, one way we could try and do this would be to take some tricks from the molecular gastronomy crowd. In a now very old video on the channel, we explore the use of an enzyme called transglutaminase that we can try here. Its colloquial name is meat glue, but it's not really glue per se, it's not sticky. Instead, what it does is catalyze the chemical bonding of proteins together. Specifically, any protein that contains the amino acids glutamine and lysine. If there's glutamine and lysine present, the enzyme just connects them together. And this doesn't just apply to meat. Any protein source with these amino acids can be stuck together with this enzyme. There are a lot of classy ways to use this enzyme, and some sketchy ways too. The classy ways make nice fillets out of things that you can't usually make a fillet out of, like salmon or to make bacon-wrapped rounds that don't fall apart, or make a perfect terrine. The sketchy uses, though, are gluing cheap cuts of meat together and trying to pass them off as a more expensive cut. Like all tools, it's how you use it that matters. Many years ago, I was watching a YouTube video about molecular gastronomy, and they were talking about a dish that they had made where they had made noodles entirely out of shrimp using transglutaminase. So we can just start by trying that, and maybe the noodles will be strong enough to be useful. The process is actually remarkably simple. First, we prepare the shrimp by removing the shells. These aren't garbage, we'll need them later. Then we devein the shrimp because nobody wants poop in their noodles. Then we just blend them into a nice smooth paste. On the side, I'll mix up a scoop of the meat glue with some water. It doesn't take much as this is an enzyme that keeps working until it's cooked. With that ready, I can just mix it into the shrimp paste until it's evenly incorporated. Now, before the enzyme has time to do its thing, I spread the paste out in a nice, thin layer on a baking tray covered in nonstick film. This is then covered tightly with plastic wrap and allowed to sit in the fridge for at least an hour or two. When it's done, we're left with a sheet of pure shrimp. It's flexible, but it has its limits, though I don't know about making a sweater out of this salmonella nightmare. Instead, I'm going to keep processing it by slicing the sheet carefully into strands and blanching them in well-salted boiling water for a minute or two. This will leave us with cooked noodles. To finish these off, I'm going to toss them in a pan with some garlic and olive oil. A bit of cheese will squeeze a lemon, and you've got lunch! Wait. Shit, we were supposed to be making fabric. I got distracted because these looked delicious and I was hungry. My bad. They were tasty, though. In truth, neither the sheet nor the noodles would have made a very nice outfit. They lack enough strength to be made into proper thin fibers that can be woven, and while you can kind of braid them into a sort of rope, not even 2010 Lady Gaga could pull off a dress made out of shrimp spaghetti slowly going septic on the red carpet. So if we want to make fabric out of shrimp, we're going to need to take a different approach. Instead of the meat, what about those shells we saved from earlier? Well, that's actually where things get interesting. You see, shrimp shells, and the shells of most bugs and creepy crawlies, marine or otherwise, are made primarily of a polymer called chitin. Chitin is basically meat's attempt at making cellulose. It's made of a long chain of sugar molecules, but notably unlike cellulose, it has this amine group hanging off the side of the chain. That amine makes it very easy to control the solubility of the polymer. If you stick an acetyl group on it, it becomes completely insoluble in water, and that's the state you'll find chitin in most of the time. But if you pop those acetyl groups off, it becomes readily soluble in acidic solutions. This form, with very few acetyl groups, is called chitosan. Now, chitosan is amazing. For years, my friends and I have joked that any time we get stuck trying to solve a problem, the answer is often, have you tried adding chitosan? It is easily the most adaptable and useful polymer I have ever come across. It's antimicrobial, it quickly stops bleeding, it can be used in brewing as a flocculating agent, it has incredible material properties, and it is extremely easy to chemically modify to change its properties to expand its uses further. It is also an extremely abundant waste product as the result of the seafood industry, with millions of tons being produced per year. 
Shrimp is the fruit of the sea. You can barbecue it, boil it, broil it, bake it, saute it. There's um, shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole. Chitin is second only to cellulose as the most abundant biopolymer on Earth. All the shrimp, crab, and lobster waste, for example, could theoretically be converted into usable chitosan. Most importantly for today's discussion, it can be made into bioplastic and fibers very easily. Its only problem is that it's hard to make it behave like a thermoplastic. As in, you can't easily form it by melting it and shaping the melted plastic. It's usually formed by drying out a solution of it into a mold. This means that you can't injection mold it, which has seriously prevented more widespread use. But for making fibers, that's fine, because we can wet spin it like we've shown in a previous video. If you missed it, a little while ago we showed off our homemade wet spinning machine, and we used it to turn regular milk into fiber and recreated a process that was invented in the early 1900s. It was a fun video, so I recommend you check it out after this one, but the important part is that we can easily reuse the machine by just switching out what we load into the injection syringe. Though, before we can do that, how do we go from these shrimp shells to usable chitosan we can spin in the first place? The process is actually incredibly simple and is just three core steps. Demineralization, deproteination, and deacetylation. Which is all accomplished by treating the shells with simple solutions of either acid or alkali. Let's go through it step by step. By random happenstance, as we were shopping for this project, we found a bag of pre-cooked crayfish tails on sale, so we're going to be using those instead of shrimp, but it's the same process regardless of your source of chitin. We start by removing as much of the meat from the shells as physically possible. If you were already using a waste stream, this most likely would be done, but for now, we had to do it manually. But then it's on to the demineralization step. Industrially, at this stage, the shells would have been washed, dried, and ground into a fine powder to help the conversion. I'm going to leave the tails intact, though, so you can watch their transformation more carefully. In a large beaker with water, the shells are acidified with concentrated hydrochloric acid to remove any minerals in the shells. I added enough acid to make about a 10% solution. This is allowed to stir and react for several hours, and the acid will remove all of the calcium carbonate and other minerals from the shells. Next, the shells are filtered to remove the acid. Then they're transferred to a fresh beaker and a 10% solution of sodium or potassium hydroxide is added. To help speed things along, the temperature is brought up to about 90 degrees Celsius and it's left for at least two hours. This step will remove any proteins and pitty much anything else that's left besides the chitin. It'll also begin to leach a lot of the color out of these incredibly red shells. But when it's done, the shells can be filtered out again. I kind of want to revisit this just to do something with this amazing red pigment that comes from the shells, but that'll have to be for another day. All that's left is to pop the acetyl groups off the chitin to render it soluble. So after a filter and a rinse like before, the shells are suspended in a solution of 45% sodium or potassium hydroxide. And this time we just straight up boil it for at least two hours, topping up the water as it evaporates. When all is said and done, the shells have lost a huge amount of volume and are largely transparent now. I'm sure that they could have used a blend and to be cooked more, but let's see how well we did on the conversion. After we strain and rinse the shells, we can test them by trying to dissolve them in vinegar. As it mixes, the pieces start to dissolve and form a thick snot. This is the mark of proper chitosan, though the large amount of debris means that the conversion was far from perfect. This is why we typically blend or grind the shells into very fine pieces to help this along. Now, we could try and use this for spinning, but the molecular weight is all over the place and the chunks in here that don't dissolve properly will definitely mess with the spinning process. So to save the headache that it would cause to try and run this through the machine, we're going to use commercially prepared chitosan for the rest of our experiment. All right, to get things started for wet spinning, we need to prepare what is called our spinning dope. No, not like that. A spinning dope is just the stock solution that will extrude into a fiber. Unfortunately, chitosan has this really fun property that as you try and dissolve it, it becomes more and more akin to snot. And so you end up fighting clumping until the very end. Normally, if I have to dissolve chitosan, I set it up at least a day before I need it. And even then, the absolute maximum that you're going to get to dissolve easily is about 3% by weight. This thick gloop is about as far as you can push the solution to accept more chitosan, but for spinning, we really need upwards of a 10-12% to chitosan solution. So the only way to achieve that is to make an initial solution and then drive off the excess water. The easiest way to do that is with the help of an overhead mixer and gentle heating. 
Keep the solution at around 60 to 70 degrees and the water will slowly be driven out. In my case, this took overnight. The next day when it had cooked down enough, I turned off the heat and allowed it to cool. Now, how do we go from this bucket of what looks like a cross between honey and snot into a nice usable fiber? It's actually fairly straightforward. Chitosin is only soluble in acid, right? So we neutralize the acid by injecting the spinning dope into a bath of sodium hydroxide. This will quickly produce nice noodles of chitosin, though we're not going to eat these ones. With our dope prepared, we can start spinning. If this is your first time seeing our wet spinning machine, here's the penny tour. At the start is a syringe pump that will extrude our goop. This extrudes the goo into a first bath called the coagulation bath and is where the fiber is initially formed. This delicate fiber is then pulled over the rollers into a second bath, which today we're using as a wash bath. Then the fiber is brought up through this set of three rollers, which are set so that each one is faster than the last. This stretches the fiber and helps align the molecules. And finally, the fiber is coiled onto a spool. For today, the coagulation bath is filled with a 10% sodium hydroxide solution with 5% formaldehyde, and the wash solution is a 10% solution of baking soda. Unfortunately, the last time we used the machine, we'd made a whole list of little changes and upgrades that we wanted to do, but at the time of filming, we hadn't, you know, done them yet. And since there is a lot less literature on making chitosan fiber than milk fiber, this round of spinning was wildly temperamental. We spent a few days trying to get the machine to play nice with the chitosan, but the fiber kept breaking as it got stuck in the wheels. So for today, for the sake of proof of concept, we ended up just doing a lot of the fiber pulling by hand. We made an assembly line where one person would be carefully pulling the fiber hand over hand from the first bath into the second. When they had a nice long noodle, it was broken off and handed to the next two people to carefully be hung up on drying lines. All that was left was to let them dry out. When all was said and done, we were left with a collection of beautiful golden fibers. Now, I mentioned proof of concept a moment ago, and there's a reason for that. It's not just a cop-out because we had issues with the machine, we're actually going to keep working with chitosan to make fiber, and we'll do a follow-up video when we work out all the kinks. The reason for that is actually pretty cool. Uh, literally. Over on the amazing channel Nighthawk in Light, Ben has been working on producing what's called a sky-cooling fabric. This strange type of fabric has the odd property that in full sun, it actually cools down instead of heating up. So it will end up several degrees colder than room temperature. It does this by radiating all the heat it absorbs at a special infrared wavelength that the atmosphere can't absorb. So the energy just flies away instead of bouncing off the air molecules and getting reflected back into the fabric. It's a super clever concept, and Ben has made a bunch of amazing videos on the topic as he works to make a high-quality sky-cooling fabric. Well, as it happens, because chitosan is always the answer to everything, as I was researching this video, I stumbled onto a paper that made an incredibly high-performance sky-cooling fabric out of chitosan and silica, both two incredibly cheap materials. So, once we're done with our proof of concept today, we're going to refine the mixture and method and upgrade our spinning machine to see if we can make some really nice sky-cooling yarns and fabrics. Just imagine, it's a sweater made out of shrimp that makes you cold in full sun. I mean, who wouldn't want one of those? But before we can do that, let's try weaving some of this chitosan fiber now that it's dry. One issue with these fibers is that their diameter was a little bit too big because we had to use a larger diameter needle. So they look a little bit like golden fishing line. This also affected their ability to bend a little bit, so their thickest parts were slightly brittle. But the fiber themselves were actually quite strong, much stronger than the milk fiber we made last time, so that's a win. Since this is just a quick and dirty test, we picked up this adorable little hand loom so we could make a tiny test swatch of fabric. With the aid of a fair bit of tape and patience, we were able to load it with fiber and start weaving. When we got tired of weaving and had a big enough piece that we could handle it, we removed it from the loom. Now, obviously we can't make much of anything with this, but it is proof that you can go from shrimp shells to fabric. And from working with it, I can tell it's going to be a beautiful material once we're done tweaking the settings. The chitosan is so adaptable and modifiable. Next time, after we make the modifications to allow for sky cooling, we're also going to be adding a post-processing step to put the acetyl groups back onto the chitosan, rendering it permanently insoluble and hopefully highly washable. And then it's only a hop, skip, jump, and ride on Shai Halud from there to a real working still suit. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. If you've made it this far in the video, it's probably safe to say you like learning things. Or at the very least, you've been so traumatized by that initial cocktail splat that you were too frozen to switch to another video. 
Either way, learning is good for you, and you don't need a pile of ocean bugs and a cabinet of caustic chemicals to learn new things and stay sharp. Instead, consider the amazing sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is the amazing online learning platform that I've used for many years. Through their highly interactive lessons, you can learn about all sorts of different topics. Everything from basic to advanced math, data analysis, physics, chemistry, biology, programming, and so much more. Whether you're in school or just want to learn and stay sharp, there's something for everyone and every skill level. The lessons are highly interactive and a lot of fun, making it a fantastic way to learn. A lot of the footage you've been watching comes from their scientific thinking course, and while I've recommended it for years, they've continued to improve it so it's only gotten better. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash the Thought Emporium, or click the link in the description. And as an added bonus, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. But with that, we come to the end of this video. A special thanks to our amazing patrons and channel members that help make these videos possible. But that's all for now, and we'll see you next time.